see you and not or hear you and not not listen to me. So if they miss my opening spiel, that's absolutely fine. I'm sure. Is that all right with you, Andrew? Absolutely fine. Okay, great. Thank you for inviting me. Good. Thanks for thanks for being here, and thanks for everyone for being here. So. Hello and welcome to our first King's College London School of Security Studies Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Cafe Chat, EDI Cafe Chat for short. Um, my name is Amanda Chisholm and I'm a senior lecturer in the school teaching and researching on gender and global security. I am also the school lead on EDI. These cafes were started as an opportunity for us to engage on important aspects of EDI in higher education um, and to highlight where challenges to achieving equality, diversity and inclusion stubbornly stick, question why this might be the case, but also highlight where interventions are working. Today our cafe chat is focusing on gender publishing gap within IR and global security studies journals most broadly. We begin this chat with the question, do women publish less? Of course, we know the answer is yes. We have an established scholarship of quantitative and qualitative based, or based research that highlights this is the case. I just want to um, point now to international affairs editor Leah DeHaan captures the stats well in her recent editorial. Uh, she um, quotes, while women make up 31.8% of ISA memberships and 36% of PSA memberships to international professional um, international relation bodies, articles authored by women in lead IR journals sits anywhere from 20 to 30%. So there's still a significant gap there. Why women publish less has also been researched. I'll just mention a few studies here. Uh, a 2019 Global Security Studies publication authored by Rubley, Jackson, Parajan, Peterson, and Duncombe drew upon a 2019 survey of International Security section, Studies section uh, members, that's a subsection of ISA, um, to find women's and men's experiences of this section vastly differed. Women were far more likely to define this ISA section as an old boys network, insular, and hostile to women. And I think this study speaks to the inability for some members to feel like they fit in to these intellectual spaces that are designed to support creativity that is necessary foundation to publishing. Who holds secure academic positions also matters in our ability to publish. A 2015 ISA survey showed that men were overrepresented in permanent positions and women were overrepresented in precarious ones. In the UK, the situation is even more dire with Black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups. In 2019, the UK had only 25 Black women professors, compared to 4,340 white women professors and 12,790 white men in the academy. Uh, a recent article that was authored by Wright, Hastrum, and Garina, Equalities in Freefall, shows how these aforementioned stats continue to place women, fame, and LGBTQI plus in structurally precarious positions. And holding these positions means that achieving the markers of academic success, that is publishing and getting funding, are more difficult to achieve. And COVID-19 um, certainly exacerbates the negative impacts that disproportionately landed on these groups. So what these surveys and studies tell us is that the gap in publishing should not be understood in isolation. This gap sits alongside a broader gender and BAME LGBTQI plus gaps in citations, which continue to be a key metric used for promotion as well as job hire in academia gaps in who we include in our syllabi, who we ask to be keynote speakers, who we mentor and network with, who we hire, who we fund, and who we promote. So yes, women and BAME and LGBTQI indeed do publish less. We're also learning the complex reasons as to why this is the case and the material implications. What we actually do to achieve meaningful change and address these gaps, we know much less about. And it is this question and reflections that we hope to engage with now in this chat. To do so, I want to warmly welcome Professor Andrew Dorman and to thank you, Andrew, for taking the time to chat with us today. Professor Dorman is um, the commissioning editor of International Affairs. He previously taught at the University of Birmingham, where he completed his master's and doctoral degrees, and the Royal Navy or Royal Naval College in Greenwich. 
alongside being based in the Department of Defense Studies at KCL and the UK Defense Academy, he is also a research associate at the University of Pretoria. Andrew Dorman's research focuses on the interaction of policy and strategy, utilizing the case studies of British defense and security policy and European security. He has held grants with the ESRC, British Academy, Leverhulme Trust, Ministry of Defense, and US Army War College. Today, though, we asked Professor Dorman to talk to us in the capacity of his role as commissioning editor for International Affairs. The format of this chat is to have open and live um, question and answer session with um, Andrew. What I'd ask of everyone who's attending is that you pose your questions within the chat box or raise your hand, either or, um, and, uh, and then we can have your, your question asked to Andrew. I'll read them out or you can raise your hand and ask them yourself and hopefully he'll be able to respond. Uh, before we open up to questions and answers, though, I'd like to first give the floor to Andrew by asking you to explain how international affairs has come to realize this publishing problem in more detail and the specific interventions you as a journal are working to address them. So, Andrew, I will hand the floor over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind invitation and, and support. Uh, I took over the Editorship, editorship of International Affairs in 2015. For those who may not know, International Affairs is one of the oldest journals we have in our profession. It covers the whole range of international relations and its audience aims to speak both to academics and policy makers. And it's a great privilege to pick up that journal um, and there's been a whole series of editors before that and it's covered a whole series of disciplines. It, what was apparent when I pick up, picked up the journal and I, in the early part is that international affairs had very much focused on traditional transatlantic uh, European uh, security as, as one of its strong benchmarks, one of its strong areas of expertise and that m much of its authorship was based in the UK and in that transatlantic and Oceania Caucasus and as an editorial team when I, and I very much thank all those who are part of the team I'm in who for that real hard work, is that if international affairs wants to represent the whole of the international relations, cover the whole of the discipline, we need to hear everybody's voice. And we were aware that actually we were con quite constrained in whose voices we were actually hearing. So, and we looked, we've very much opened the journal up to anyone can sub submit pieces and we will do the usual peer review process of trying to get the best pieces into the journal covering a full range of subjects. What was apparent is that, and has already been identified, is women generally submit proposals and papers far less than men, disproportionately less compared to how much they're represented in the field. And I, we thought as a team, this is, this is we're not hearing the female voice amongst others. And we talked to various other editors and so forth about how we could change things. You know, we could spread the word, say that we wanted more women in, in the journal, we wanted to hear more voices, we changed the editorial board, so the editorial board had a much greater female representation, in fact they were in the majority, but it wasn't actually de delivering the levels of submissions we would have hoped for. Um, and we had a, a panel which we held at the ISA convention in Toronto, and given looking at gender and journals which brought together a whole series of people who looked at the subject, uh, journal editors say, you know, entitled, where are all the women? Why aren't we hearing, seeing w women's voices? And at that panel, Ruth Blakely, head of department now at uh, Sheffield, set, uh, and her, was then uh, just stepping down as the editor of the Review of International Studies and said, wouldn't it be interesting, wouldn't it be great, what happens if a major journal committed itself to having half its pieces by female academics. So um, as a team, we sat down and thought, we'll take on the Ruth Blakely challenge. So we launched, uh, 2020 is the centenary anniversary of Chatham House. It's not ours, but it's since uh, that. We're doing, for 2020, what's known as the 50-50 challenge. We'll look to have an even submission, uh, uh, publication in all aspects, whether it be articles, be it webinars, be it reviews, book reviews and so forth. What would happen if all our half our pieces by, by female academics? All achieving the same level of uh, requirements as everybody else, but what would it look like? 
so we set ourselves that challenge and that's what we're trying to press ahead with this year and that's the background to our 50 50 initiative so we wanted to look at female representation the other initiative we've got in the background which we will push much more next year is the early career diversity initiative which is aiming to hear and support those who are coming from diverse backgrounds who are who are not in the same position to compete to get their pieces published they don't have the same advantages um, particularly from those from the global south um, we are looking to look at their mentoring process where we we see pieces coming in that we think have potential but are not or will not get through the review process we will look to try and pair people up with some of our editorial team our editorial board members and see if we can help develop those pieces um, those are our initiatives we don't think we're going to make a major change in terms of the numbers of people we will change but if we make a change perhaps that, and we hope with the 50 50 other journals will pick this up and um, take it forward and that's our background and um, looking forward to quite questions and answers thank you great start my video great thank you andrew for that um yeah and it's certainly creating creating waves um important positive waves across i think ir and security studies so thank you for that thank you for the challenge and and fingers crossed other other journals will um will follow suit i guess you know it's 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 such an important um politics to even set the 50 50. uh we do have a question though um from uh, Julia Wellen through Twitter, and she's just asking about, you know, so, so setting that challenge, but also acknowledging the various other constraints for why women might not be submitting. Um, is there a way, uh, what, what ways are you reaching out to particularly women, um, but other, uh, otherwise other underrepresented communities to, to encourage them to um to submit to your journal is it a matter of you know um pr in terms of international affairs or what sort of what 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 is the concrete i guess um measures you're taking to encourage more women to submit great question and it's the challenge i think before most journal editors who, who who want to accept that challenge for us we want to make the experience whether people are successful or unsuccessful in getting their piece into international affairs as smooth and as positive as it, as it can be. So we look to do very rapid, as quickly as possible turnaround times. We keep people engaged in terms of where the process, review process is. We are sympathetic. We try to address those issues. We are reaching out to different communities, such as um, and as a way of saying, actually, we want to hear your voice. Um, Reputations and what associations and historical legacies of institutions can be problems and challenging. And people, you know, we were very aware that, that with international affairs, that people in some respect thought of it as a bit of an old boys network, an old boys club. So it's taken us a number of years to try and reach out to people and, and, and break that down. But if you look, for example, we in 2022 is our 100th anniversary and we've got an advert out for a special edition. Um, and we've said, it's, you know, if people that are putting the proposals in for that special edition, we've said actually we want to hear that you know that submissions should include or incorporate um, levels of uh, gender balance. They should incorporate. Or we want to see scholars who are based in the global south. Um, so those are part of the criteria which people would expect to meet. So if you put a special edition into us, if we're part of a section, you know we, we want to hear other voices. Some of the criteria. So we have rejected proposals for special edition done special sections because they have been all male or they've all been from one country. Okay. Um, I remember we I had a very good submission on European foreign policy from scholars that are all based in Europe and it talked about how European foreign policy would interact with the world but there was not a single voice from outside of Europe. It's just not, we, we can't go with this. This is, we, we end up just talking to ourselves. So you can put some criteria in and you do lots of encouragement that's what we're doing that's great um uh, thank you for that uh, i guess then the question too also and i think this has been raised to you before andrew in different forums so this yeah. is not going to be new and this isn't just for you i think this is for all of us to consider is that um to what degree do we need to focus on diversity of bodies 
So who, you know, who is actually authoring this versus or in addition to diversity of perspectives, because we also know IR as a discipline can also be quite exclusionary um, in not only different perspectives that are taken seriously, but um, different ways in which we write, you know, whether fiction, for example, poetry, different sort of vignettes um, that I know some journals have been exploring more than others. Is, is, this, um, is this something that international affairs is also concerned with? Or, or how are you grappling with that sort of um, aspect of the IR debate? Another, another great question. And like all editorial teams, everything's a compromise. I mean, you're, you're, as an editorial team, we're pulled in multiple directions between trying to get impact factor, getting the cutting edge pieces out there, getting pieces read, get pieces that are going to be interesting, trying to break new dynamics. And for all, in all this, and getting diversity as part of that, is everything is a compromise. It's nothing's perfect. Um, what we've sought to do um, is to broaden and welcome the whole span of international relations. For example, we've in this current year we had a ISA have got a new section on religion. Religion's always been part of international relations, whether we've often not ignored it. So we had a, a collection of papers on, on on religion and IR, which was really interesting. We've also had a recent section on visuality, which is a sort of a growing representation. And that's a, it was absolutely fascinating collection of papers. So we're looking to develop at the moment articles in more in a more traditional sense of what an article is or has been covering a whole range of different disciplines and, different, and subjects so we're open to that we haven't yet particularly in terms of other ways of presenting material we've done lots on social media and blogs and so forth webinars but in terms of the hard copy we haven't yet moved towards different forms of of article um, whether we will do in the future is to is to be determined we haven't yet taken that step um, there's only so many steps you can take at any one time yeah, uh, absolutely. But those are um, yeah, those are really great insights, nonetheless. Anyway, so um, yeah, I think this is a tougher question, but I guess it's also okay. you know how, how you're reflecting you know yourself as a journal, as you know, as I as I brought in the introduction. Um, journals are not isolated, right? This is this is uh -huh. these, are, these issues are always interconnected. So, how are you as a journal thinking about the publishing gender gap? as it relates to the other gaps within academic um, knowledge production, right? And again, you know, hinting to the gaps in who has secure permanent employment that has maybe more of a space to creatively think who is institutionally part of the in crowd where they feel like they have more of, you know, space for creativity. Um, are you thinking about that in, as a journal and in what ways are you thinking about that? We are, we're thinking about it. Um, the things we can change, the things that we can actually do is um, in terms of who publishes for us and what they publish on. Those are the things we have control of. We can't control what other journals publish on. We can't control how people are recruited. We cannot try control the whole rest of the academic field in terms of all, all, the, all the other limitations. We can only do it from our sense of perspective as, 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 a, as a, a journal. Um, so our goal is to broaden our remit in terms of, so we include everybody, everyone has a chance to publish in international affairs. There's still got to be a certain level, a certain standard. With our early career initiative, we are looking at to helping some of those who from the disadvantaged backgrounds to give them a chance to put themselves into onto a level playing field. Is it? Um, that's what we're doing through that initiative. Um, in terms of subject matter, we're we're open. We look to see, and we're, we're one of the things we, we have two boards. We have a editorial board, which is based on UK-based scholars, which traditionally met twice a year, and we have an international board of, of equal great academics drawn from across the globe. And we, we keep saying to them, "What are we missing?" One of the things we're charging them is, with is, whose voices are we not hearing? What subjects are we not covering? You know, and. Because as an editorial board, given we cover the whole of international relations, unlike most, if, you, if you're a narrow specialist journal, it, your editorial team at specialist and knows that, that field really well. Given we cover the whole of the field, we don't know it all or where, where the new debates are. So we are very 
much dependent and rely on our editorial boards to support us in looking out for the new voices and new areas. And they regularly come in to us and say, you need to think about this, you need to think about that. And, and we try and embrace it and work with them on that. Great, thank you. Um, I want to open it up to uh, our participants as well. If you have any questions, please raise your hands. Um, I guess while I'm waiting for the hands raised, this is more of an interest of mine. Um, and Andrew, I don't know if you can answer. I mean, you just explained because you're such, you know, you cover the breadth and depth of IR security studies. It's hard to get sub subject matter experts on everything and anything, but have, what what are you guys doing as a journal or do you see it as a problem of the broader citation gaps because we hear about women increasingly you know not getting in, not getting cited but also um fame community not getting cited um and who we cite is a matter of politics too right so so is and i i get it's tricky because it also relies on who your reviewers are and if they're going to pick up on that or not but is there any sort of um larger you know kind of journal response to this citation problem that you guys are looking at you're right to identify it's by now identify that you know men tend to cite men and uh, the, the, free, the women's voice and, and the minority groups are, are not cited near the same extent. Um, like a lot of journals, I mean, this is a capacity issue. We don't go through, as an editorial team, I don't think any other journal goes through all the references of a particular piece to find and look them up. We haven't got the capacity to do that. It's also difficult, and this is, there's some structural challenges here. Because of GDPR, for example, I we do not know the things like ethnicity of our, our who submits to us. We can't measure this. One of the ways we've looked at gender is by how people define themselves when they talk in their, in their biographies. That's how we measured that. Because we can't actually go out and say to and understandably say, can you tell me you know, your gender background, your ethnicity, your uh, sexuality? One of the challenges we got is for representation is if we want to see how well we're doing, we need metrics to measure how we're doing this against. But actually some of the data is very difficult to actually be allowed to record for understandable reasons. Um, so how do we deal with that? Well, we rely on our reviewers to look, you know, and we go, like a lot of journals, go for specialist reviewers to look at it and say, how well are they doing? You know, it is fully represented. You know, in our guidelines, we talk to both our authors but also to our reviewers about checking those and we're reliant on the reviews for that. Interestingly the assumption would be that the more from the statistics would suggest that the more you shift the balance towards female like, scholars writing for you theoretically your impact factor should drop. Ours has gone up, Yet our, our, our figures are going the other way. So we have a counterintuitive experience for ourselves that actually as we've broadened our diversity, our impact factor has actually gone up. And interestingly, you know, we pushed to go from a way and encourage young voices and diverse voices, and it's not affecting our impact factor. It might do in the future. If theoretically, given the empirical evidence out there, it should have done, our impact factor should have dropped as it is. We've, we're now fourth out of 95. Um, so it actually has been really positive for us. Um, when we look at, which pieces are viewed, which pieces are cited, there is still a gender gap here. Um, now, we, it's not that we promoted men's pieces more, or but there is a real challenge. We can't actually make our readership read in an in a impartial way. That's one of the real challenges. We can do our bit to try and encourage them to do so, but how they actually read it um, is an interesting, is, is, is a gap there. Yeah, I mean that that hint that this is the broader structures, broader biases that seem to be so, so ingrained, right? That are that are difficult to address. Yeah. yeah, so it's navigating, like you said, what what the journal can do um, in 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 this broader kind of capacity and resources. Um, we have a question here from Amy. Uh, Amy yep. asks in the chat box, uh, do you have an action plan? Um, so I guess she's probably looking at more concrete, right? An action plan, and if so, what does it entail? 
are your goals generalized or specialized to different sectors? So I guess she's looking for more concrete kind of, how do you plan um, more concretely? I guess you've talked a bit about the concretes around um, meeting the 50-50 gender, but um, no. more concretes, I guess, around um, early career researchers or whatnot. What are the kind of concrete, you, you mentioned, you know, people from disadvantaged backgrounds to work with them, but what I guess are the concrete, how are you working with them? How are you going to mentor them? Is that part of your plan? And can you tell us about it? I hope I represented that right, Amy. If I didn't, please raise your hand and clarify, but um, I hope I represent that right. Okay, how do we, how, how we, have we done things? So I've mentioned, that we've, as we said, we've mentioned the 50-50 initiative, which is about very much encouraging. And then we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be very open in terms of how well we've performed. So you, 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 you kindly refer to the, the great report that Laird Le Hand did for us as part of our team which audited where we were between 2017 and 2019. And I think one of the ways we can, as a, a profession, change is if we are very open in it, how journalists perform. And you, in your introduction, you kindly, you mentioned the, the work of um, Maria Rubley and, and, and co in that audit of um, the international security section of ISA. And it's interesting, they audited five journal, security journals. And I think, you know, trying to hold some of them to account for their relative poor performance when it came to submissions. And, you know, it's one of the ways the profession can start to hold journals to account. How well are you doing? Be honest about this. Um, so what are we doing? Yes, we're, we're doing lots of encouragement. We're doing, trying to commit to gender balance. We, with our early career diversity initiative, we see it as a mentoring program where, and we, you know, there was, a, what we are seeing is we, and it can come through a number of ways. If we get a piece that's submitted, and we've had it, where a piece has been submitted by an individual who, you know, who's identified themselves with issues of, of, of unfairness, unfairness and, and, and we think actually there is something in this piece. We think there is, you know, they've got, they've got, a, they've got a really interesting idea, but it's not going to get through review. It's not because of their disadvantage. They're not going to be able to get this through. So what we we will do is. If we can, we all pair them up with one of our board, and I've done it as an editor in the past where we've paired them up. We said, okay, we're going to set, take it out of the review process at this point. Tell them, these, start to make it, this is what you need to change. These are the things. So since, if you think for a lot of early career researchers in the, in the, the leading universities, they can get their stuff here internally reviewed by their cohort, by their supervisor, other people around them, you know, they've got those ways of getting testing. They can do conferences. Well, they could do conferences before COVID-19 and we went to a whole new world in that respect. But you could get your, you could test your work before you sent it into a, you know, a, a, a credible journal and to see how it went. There's people who can't do that. So one of the things we were aware of struggling to do that so we were sent to, sent to create that internal way of doing that by mentoring them, giving them feedback, and hopefully getting them to a place where they could submit to international affairs, or actually they might submit to a different journal. And if, you know, we would judge success is if we can take one of the pieces you know, from somebody, help them develop, get them sum to submit to international affairs or another journal, and it gets through. Fantastic. Um, but if, you know, if it doesn't go to international affairs, but gets into another journal, that's a result, as far as we're concerned. Um, that's our contribution. Now we're only going to be able to do it to a limited capacity, but we, 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 that's what we're trying to do. What other things are we trying to do? So we set ourselves a target of, with that, those two initiatives. We also work through things like special editions and special sections, and making criteria in, and where we focus to try and get other voices heard. So when um, we moved from Wiley to Oxford University Press in 2017, our first edition in January 2017 was on India. And it was, and we had academics focus in India. India had been in there, had been written about in international affairs for quite some time. You know, we famously talk about we have Gandhi as one of our previous authors. And he is a previous author. You know, not many journals can say that, but it's when they have been neglected. So we got a whole series of people to write and, and special edition on India. We've also reached out now recently in a special edition on, in January of 2020 on Indo-Pacific. And virtually all the scholars there who wrote on it were from the region. 
the only, I think, two you could question were actually based on the East Coast of the States as opposed to the West Coast of the States. But other, there was not a single European writing on Indo-Pacific. They were all from the region. So we reached out, we put some limits on that. And our competition for our specialty, you say, make sure that you actually have gender balance when you put the proposal together. Make sure you have people, a diverse collection of, of um, authors. So, you know, the metrics I've had submission, I had to remember such success a special section proposal of five pieces from really big names. And they went, well, one of them's female and um, oh, we've got somebody who's based at, at one of the Ivy Leagues, they represent the Global South. And we went, that's not balance. So we said, no, it's not. So we rejected it. It would have been a good addition, but it would have been very male centric. So we, know, we can put some of those criteria and that's how we can make some changes. Great. That's answered it. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the ways in which, like you said, the journal has to have some standards that are just non-negotiable, right? If we want to move on yep. it, um, no matter how brilliant or, or fascinating, for example, that special issue might have been, right? So, yeah. Yep. Um, we've got a question from Emily here that I think touches upon how we address uh, an inherent reputational issue, I guess, too, um, with the journal, but more broadly speaking, she asks, how, how far does imposters, imposter syndrome play into all of this, when, especially when we're trying to reach out to disadvantaged communities? Um, and she says, I think a very big challenge is getting people to make the jump into thinking their work is suitable for international affairs. Many people, particularly um, women, maybe, question mark, she asks, might never feel like their work is ready for publication like international affairs. So the amazing outreach work that you're saying, particularly with the early careers, I guess is, you know, is when they actually submit. How are you engaging with people before they submit to get them to encourage sure. them that, you know, we will work with you. Yes, we want you. And, you know, your, your work would be worthy here. Okay, that was a great question. When we, we've done outreach, um, we always do a meet the editor session if we can. With any conference we go to, we try and get to set up a panel of that. Which, because what we're very aware as, as an editorial team, and a lot of editor, other, other journalists will say the same, is you know, the mysteries of, of publishing in a journal. You know, what, are, what, sense, what, are, what are the, what are the, what are the, what are the secret, secrets of it? And so we always try, and if we can, do a meet that. So a chance for anybody and everybody to ask questions of editors. And we often do a session. Um, we recently did one online with, uh, in, in, in conjunction with the Beezus. We had uh, four different journal editors in. So I say, look, we want to break the taboos. We want to break the ideas and mythologies about what the, what are, the, what are the pitfalls and easy things to avoid doing? What, what are the lessons to take? And then we, if you look at our blog, there's a whole series of, of pieces we've got on there to give guidelines and that lessons about how to, what the do's and don'ts of not of publishing online. Um, so we, we've got material that people consult, we, we do that. Um, it's interesting, Ruth Blakely, who I referred to earlier as uh, when she was at Ed, Chief Editor of the Review and Tertiary Studies, had some really interesting statistics for the Review and Tertiary Studies. She said, disproportionately men submitted, but if women did submit, they were more likely to be accepted. So we, you know, and one of the challenges you've got is we make great generalizations, but everybody's story is different. But the generalization it is, and this is important, it links into your point about imposter syndrome, well, women are probably more reticent about a submitting a piece, in that they won't take the chance, if we put it in those crude terms. But if they, when they do, they're more likely to be accepted. And this is a, probably generally across most journals. Um, so the encouragement is take the chance, because you're more likely to be accepted, because actually it seems to be based on the statistics we have and, and the evidence we've got, is that actually, women's pieces are more likely to be more complete and more likely to be accepted. So therefore they should take the chance. I would like the course that probably means that the acceptance rates will slightly drop. Um, we can reach out beforehand as a way of encouraging them to, we can reach out through experience. It's interesting, a lot of people, women who've submitted to us have been encouraged to do so because other women have submitted and had pieces submitted to interest. So it's about their experience. So what we try to do, 
any piece that comes in, you know, like a good journal, we will try and turn around within 10 days and look at that desk reject set criteria. And I have to confess, we, we desk reject more than 70%. And it's not that a lot, a, lot, a lot of that would not make a journal. It's to be reasonable that it reduces us down to 30% of the pieces, we'll go out for a review and we'll take less than 10% based on the statistics. Um, we are wasting reviewers' time and those are people who submit his time if we put out more review. But we give feedback every time. For every piece that's submitted, they will get feedback. Even if they're desk rejected, they will get feedback. We get suggestions about what they can do, how they might change it, alternative journals. Because some pieces that are submitted, you just go, actually, it's not for us. And often you'll see other editors go, a piece has been submitted to us, but it's not the right piece for us. But you should try this journal or that journal, it's much more applicable. And it's knowing about the, the brand. Um, if people submit to us, they get, I will email them every two weeks to tell them how, where they are in the process until they get into production. So it's about keeping, if you submit a piece, it's not lost in international affairs for the next six months before at some point a review pops out to tell you good or bad news. You know, it's about communication, giving a positive experience and actually our experience is that women tend to link much more into networks and therefore it's about how they relate to each other and how about the communication about their experiences. So what we want to do is to give them, even if their piece is rejected, is a positive experience, that we will turn things around quickly, we'll be communicate with them, will you explain things to them? Not that they need any more explanation than men, but it, 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 it seems to be much more helpful. I, think I hope that, that helps the question. That's such a great point, too. I think it resonates for me, uh, returning to my thoughts of a PhD student and my first submission to a journal. And I think the, the, the reason I submitted to the journal I did was I got advice that even if you're rejected, the reviews are generally positive and you'll get feedback to, to develop it. So I'm you know very pleased to hear that uh, international affairs is, is doing that because I think that's important, not just for women, but anyone who, as M Emily highlights, has that imposter syndrome, which I think is rampant with PhDs and then I think academics I think we all still there's moments where we all still have imposter syndrome right so it is and, and, and the answer is you should aim high people should aim high aim at the top journals get feedback drop it down to a slightly lower journal if it gets rejected you, most pieces will get up find a place somewhere but you, if you but you know there is a yeah aim high why not yeah see what the response will be. I mean, I'm, I'm conscious of, you know, I've got good, good colleagues who've, you know, submitted pieces and they haven't heard from them, you know, who aim high, push it in, and give, it, give, it a, give it a chance. Because we, we need to hear your voice. We need, you know, the profession is, it's to the detriment of the profession and our understanding if we do not hear all these other voices. Yeah. Um, so Sarah Perrette had to scoot out, but she wanted to thank you very much for your direct answers. And actually, um, Sarah does uh, remind me, she did post this question as well, um, informally to me through WhatsApp. So I hope she doesn't mind me telling you or asking it to you. But, you know, we've talked a great deal about, about women, about early career. I wonder, um, you know, there's also another sticky point around language and how we disproportionately publish in English, right? Um, yep. and, and are, is international affairs doing anything or thinking about how to promote people who English is not their first language, um, how to promote, you know, in the, in the broader mentoring schemes for them in, in publishing, or are you looking at publishing at least abstracts in different languages? I don't know if you already do that, but something abroad, you know, broader disbursement and accessibility of the research. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a really good question. And yes, ling linguistically, yeah, English dominates. It's the, as a, it's the advantage of the uh, um, to the English amongst us uh, that actually our language is, is permeating and dominates um, and has an unfair advantage. In terms of language, we are aware as a journal that when people submit, if it's their second language and that, that the English might not be up to scratch. What I have to say, one of, we're one of the few journals, we keep virtually the whole production phase in-house. So our production team is in-house and we have um, our copy editors and our production uh, editor is all in-house and we will help people with their English. In fact, um, our production editor is, uh, she's fantastic. Um, she's, based in, she's based in Finland, 
and she corrects everybody's English. Um, whether, whether you're a native speaker or not, she, her English is better than anybody else's I've met. Um, and I have a, a good friend in the Policy Institute who's, who did read classics in Cambridge and she picked his English up. So, you know, we will help people if their language is not English is not that. And we're aware of that. And reviewers are a reviewer of that. And one of the things you, your editors will do sometimes will go out to a review and go, we think this is really good. We know the English isn't that good, but we can polish it. What do you think to the paper? What do you think to the article? And that, you know, that's a line I'll, I, I will put, I'll put in into a reviewers. Look, don't worry about the English. We can that can get sorted. We can help on that. The question is: Is the paper? Is the ideas? Are the concepts? Is the argument good enough? And that's what you ask reviewers to do. And they'll say, actually, yeah, but it needs a, it needs a proper proofread. We can do with that. Um, are we doing more into other languages? We are thinking about it and looking at it, but and it's a collective challenge for most journal editors is one of resources because actually, you know, we are you know, international affairs has an advantage. We are, we are a well-resourced journal, but actually, that there aren't that many are able to then. Do we put things into other languages? If we put abstracts into other languages, how advantageous is? We tell people with well, a new piece in English in your in your language, but you know that this is one of the debates. How much of an advantage is it to tell people that they're about to find out that there's a piece in English on that the subject you're really interested in, but you can't read it unless you can read English? It's an unfair, it's not particularly fair, but it's it's the constraint we're operating under. I'm not sure how far we can go beyond this at the moment, um, unless we use Google Translate and see what we end up with. But that's, that's not ideal. Um, so there is possibly we might start to look at that in the future, but we've hesitated ourselves about using abstracts into other languages simply because all it is doing is to tell people we have now pieces in English. Is that sufficient, good enough with them? Is that just since rubbing their noses in it? You know, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, and it's, I mean, there's also the accessibility behind paywalls for a lot of these, um, you know, if we're trying to reach out to people who, I, are based in yeah, universities yeah. that don't have libraries that maybe subscribe to all these different journals with the paywalls too, right? So, yeah. You're right. I mean, the payroll is an economic model of how journals are, are paid for, is, is the honest answer. And unless we change the economic model, you know, I know there's been lots of call for everything being open access, but there is a, there's a production, there's a cost associated with producing and putting, creating a journals, even if they go online. And purely online in terms of the production side, doing and all that. So there's always going to be some financial mechanism. Um, but you know, we have, we publish with Oxford University Press, and I know they have a system where there is a process for which um, the uh, institutions or organisations that have not got the resources can apply, and they have a I think a quota where they they reach out so they can get free admission. Which is great. Or, you know, we fully support that. Links into the mission of both the journal and Chatham House as well. And one of the reasons we we, we're, we like being with them is, you know, they reach out in that respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we're aware there's a paywall. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the I mean, we're just highlighting the you know the the structural or the resource issues that are beyond the journal itself. Um, um, yeah in which we can address and I think you know with with any broader uh, issues around increasing access um, it, you know that these all connect to the different uh, fi how financing of higher education is done how you know who you know all, all of these sort of things too so um, yeah um, I'm just looking to see there's doesn't seem to be any grilling question we're not grilling you enough Andrew there's not enough grilling questions That's from fine by me. <laughs> Oh gosh, yeah. I, uh, I. Go on. Sorry, you were going to say something. Sorry. Well, I would say, I mean, from international affairs, I can guarantee we, we, there's always an editor's choice. So there's always one piece in every edition w will be free and accessible, okay. and there's periodically other pieces. And if there's all the open access bits, which we can gold X and so forth. Yeah. But if get nothing else, there is always guaranteed to be one free piece in international affairs that everyone can get to. Okay. Great. This is good. I'm learning. I, I, I think I feel like I need to or want to publish with you guys now. You're just this Please is do. a journal. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I'm not sure if we have any other questions. No one seems to be raising their hands. I don't know if we're hungry because it's over lunch hour or what's going on here, but there's certainly I feel like 
this isn't the end of our conversation. And I just want to take this time to thank you, um, but also the journal so much for taking these important issues seriously and doing um, concrete measurable interventions to, to actually address this gap, right? And I really do hope um, other journals pick this up and other journals are watching the pioneering work you guys are doing and I hope they pick them up. Um, I just want to, I guess, leave the floor to you last, Andrew, if there's anything, you know, um, that you wanted to mention anything else or any sort of, um, anything at all you want to mention about broader gender publishing. I, th you know, I think it, 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 as already covered, there are so many issues and structural constraints and the the question we've had as a team and what is what what bit can we change you know and it, it, you can only t you, you can only look look at your own little orbit and say what bits can we change and i think you know it's it's spread the world that word and encourage people to submit and I, that's what i would say encourage those whose voice is feel they're like not being heard to take a chance and yeah. it, if nothing else one of the things we're going to start doing is having drop-in sessions or i say drop-in they're going to be virtual drop-in sessions so so people can come and have a chat with me and say, I've got an idea, can I run this past you, can I think about this? We used to do that a lot in, in, in the online on the conferences when we when we travelled a lot more than we do than we yeah. do now. Um, so we'll be doing that. And if people have got other ideas, we're always welcome because it's you know, we haven't got a monopoly of ideas of how to how to how to tackle these structural constraints. And if other people have got ideas, look far away. Um, we, we're happy to engage in these conversations. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. I guess I'm going to I'm going to do the silent clap, thanking you so much for um, engaging with us in this discussion. And I'm sure it's going to continue on Twitter as well, too, and in these other broader spaces. But um, thanks for joining us. Thank you for the participants who have listened um, silently, have, a, I guess, um, adhered to Zoom etiquette, apparently. Um, and thank you so much for those of you who ask questions via Twitter or via the chat. So, so um, thank you all for coming and uh, I'm, uh, this will be recorded so this will be distributed um, more widely as well to, um, for other people to, to uh, know about the amazing work International Affairs is doing. So yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank great. You. Thanks. <laughs> so I think we can, yeah.